Paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. Vegas is a world built on fantasy. But there's a dark reality just beneath the surface where good and bad guys battle every day. It's cat and mouse, just what we're doing all the time. Usually, the good guys win, but there are cheaters who are so accomplished at what they do, they get away with millions. These are their exclusive stories told by the guys who took Vegas for a ride and landed themselves into the Cheater Hall of Fame. On gaming tables in Las Vegas casinos, there are colored chips of all denominations. Only a handful of companies make them, and manufacturing processes are kept top secret. So when two devious cheats successfully counterfeited chips, it catapulted them right into the Cheater Hall of Fame. Chips are cash in casinos and would be similar to dollar bills or $20 bills. Henderson, Nevada, just 13 miles from Las Vegas. Agents from the Gaming Control Board bust a counterfeiting ring operating out of a garage. The bust itself was the first of its kind, not just in Las Vegas, but gaming control agents say the first of its kind in the country. They'd never really seen an operation like this before. In a makeshift workshop, agents find chips that are in the process of being converted from low denominations to high denominations. These are all four queen, $100 inserts. That is what sticks in the middle of a $1 chip with a little paint, and you've got a $100 chip. Now you have $1 investment and a $99 profit. I mean, it literally took some paint, some glitter, and a blow dryer, and a good idea. Behind the scam is an unlikely pair, two former construction workers. The mastermind is 40-year-old Eric Morikawa. In an exclusive interview, Morikawa reveals how he created chips that looked so real, they fooled the experts. It wasn't that easy. Um, but uh, once it came to us and we figured out a way, uh, it, it came fast. The story begins in the late 1990s. Vegas construction is booming. New casinos are going up all over town, and older casinos renovate extensively to stay competitive. In 2000, small-time contractor Eric Morikawa of Southern California moves to Las Vegas to find work. Soon, Morikawa has more work than he can handle. He hires additional help, including 20-year-old Jeremy Lewis. Jeremy I met at a, a bar shooting pool, and uh, he was out of work, and um, I gave him a job. But Morikawa's new employee has a checkered past. Jeremy Lewis was the known bad guy. He had some drug and forgery warrants outstanding in California, and he had also had multiple arrests here in the Las Vegas area. Still, Jeremy's a good worker. For a few years, business is good. Then, in 2004, the economy crashes. The construction industry took a dive, and, and work wasn't really there anymore. We were all in the same situation. The money started to deplete, and uh, we needed to take care of our families. Morikawa and his crew start doing jobs farther and farther away. But on one of their return trips, Morikawa spots something on the side of the road that gets him thinking. I saw a chip on the billboard and, and asked them how hard would it be to make the chip, and we all agreed it wouldn't be that difficult. In that moment, Morikawa and his crew decide to do what no one else has successfully done, counterfeit the currency of Vegas casino chips. We went up to Vegas, and um, we would get the chip uh, from the table. We took it back to my garage, and uh, we broke it down. We broke it in half, um, tried to see what was contained inside the chip. Casino chips are made out of clay, sand, and other earthen metals that are heated to extreme temperatures and pressed into shape. 
Morikawa and the crew start trying to replicate them. We were trying to make our own chips from scratch, from different clays, injecting metals, and trying to get it that weight. It was hard. It was really hard. In order to pass, the fake chips must have the same weight, feel, and the hollow sound that real chips make when they're dropped. The team do their own sound tests. This is the real chip, and this is the imposter. The chips that we made from scratch, it would be like a, a heavy thud. And uh, so we knew that was going to work. What are we doing? What are we doing? Weeks go by. The team still hasn't created a chip that will work. Discouraged, several crew members bail. Now it's just Morikawa and Lewis, but they're not ready to give up. Together, they spend hours studying the chips from the Green Valley Ranch Casino. Each denomination has its own colors. The $100 chip is black and gray, and the $1 chip is gray and teal. Morikawa suddenly realizes it would be easier to modify a chip than to create one from scratch. It's a huge breakthrough. So I grabbed a Sharpie pen, and uh, I just was like, well, we just need to paint black. It looks like they can take $1 chips and convert them into $100 chips with a little effort. First, they must remove the $1 inlay from the center. We tried heating it up to pull it off. Heating it up would bend the chip, so we would put it in a boiling water, and it would penetrate the inlay. The 212-degree water leaves the chip unharmed, but softens the inlay, allowing them to easily pull it off. Next step, duplicating the black and gray shades of the $100 chip. We would get our paints from an art supply store. We would sit there and just mix the colors, you know, blend them in, and then put it on the real chip, and then wait for it to dry. And, and we both look at it under light outside, you know, different types of light, and then make sure the color matched to a T. To a it was very, very, very close. Then it's on to the painting. They start with the gray color of the accent stripes, known as pips. Using an airbrush, they cover the entire chip. It had to be a light spray, which an airbrush uh, sprays really light. Once the paint dries, they block out the pips with painter's tape, then airbrush everything else black. When the tape is removed, the colors on the counterfeit chip mirror the authentic one. Eric Morikawa and Jeremy Lewis really did a good job at um, matching the colors, and that's not easy to do because the the colors are always very unique. You can't do it perfectly. They didn't do it perfectly, but they got them very close. Once the color's in place, the next step is creating the phony $100 graphic inlay. They scan a real one into a computer, then print it on clear plastic to give it a glossy look. Then the plastic is glued onto a white backing made of bumper sticker paper. You'd run the inlays through kind of like a pasta roller and the new inlay would fit perfectly inside the chip. The chip is ready, except for one crucial detail. If you were to run this chip underneath the black light, you'll see a, a, a glowing top hat and a cane, and that's one of their security features. I went out and uh, got the same color ink uh, in a pen form, and we would color the top hat and cane in there. And uh, we had a black light set up, so we'd check you know, position. They're random, so we just put it on there and uh, as long as it showed something underneath the black light, it would pass. After a month of work, they finally have three $100 counterfeit chips. Morikawa and Lewis head 10 minutes off the Vegas Strip to the Green Valley Ranch Casino in Henderson, Nevada to see if they can fool the casino. I don't lie very well, so I can't walk into the casino and keep a straight face and, and go to the um, the cashier cage and cash the chips, I, I feel guilty. Jeremy Lewis takes the lead. I'm sitting in the parking lot. I'm, I, while he's in the trying to cash these chips in the casino, I'm hoping you know everything's going OK, nothing's going to happen. Moments later, Lewis reappears. He ran up to the truck and hopped in and said, you know, drive. And we drove. I thought security was chasing them and looking over our shoulders. But no one's behind them. And when Morikawa looks over, Lewis has three $100 bills in his hand. The counterfeit ships work. <laughs> right. We were 
pretty excited. We ran back to the house and made some more. They could come down into the garage, and within five minutes, you could have a brand new chip. It was just that stunningly simple. Morikawa and Lewis are able to counterfeit 20 chips a day. They plan to work their scam all over town. To match the various chips, they stock up on supplies. There's different colors on the chips. Uh, a lot of it had like uh, glitter, so we would take the glitter pens and dab the glitter in there and give it that metallic look. They passed fraudulent chips at eight different casino properties, including Caesars Palace and Mandalay Bay. These guys were all over town. They are well on their way to the Cheater Hall of Fame, but they realize that sooner or later, cashing in chips without ever playing a single casino game is bound to arouse suspicion. To avoid getting caught, they need to change their game. We had to find a way where it was kind of foolproof, where they wouldn't be able to immediately catch on. To make the scam look legitimate, they start playing at the gaming tables, buying real chips from dealers. We'd lay $2,000 on the table, they give us the chips, and the camera overhead sees that. So we use that to our advantage. And then we would uh, exchange them either in the bathroom or parking lot uh, and, and get the, the counterfeit ones, and we'd have the real ones. If you went up to a cage and cashed them out and they caught it, you could always refer back to, hey, that table gave them to me. Later on, taking back the real ones, they wouldn't uh, question it because they were real. Morikawa and Lewis begin spending more and more time at the casinos. At the time, we graduated from the $100 chips to the $500, even the $1,000 chips, and uh, uh, the money was coming in. The lifestyle was changing. Uh, we were doing a lot of uh, eating out at nice restaurants and, and, and being on the strip. Morikawa keeps the source of his newfound wealth a secret from everyone, including his wife. At first she asked, but then she was just like, I don't want to know. And uh, she was getting new purses, clothes. Uh, at one point, I counted 100 pairs of shoes in boxes in a closet. So yeah, she was benefiting from it too. For three months, Eric and his wife enjoy their extravagant new lifestyle. But partner Jeremy Lewis heads down a much different path. I found him at a, like an $800 night suite at the Riviera. The place was bigger than my whole house. And um, he was there with a bunch of girls. And he hadn't had any sleep. He was wired. Lewis's lifestyle soon becomes a liability. One day, he was talking to one of the girls on the phone, and, and I could overhear him because it was, it was loud. So I told him, hey, hand me the phone. I want, I want to talk to her. So he gave me the phone, and she said, I know everything that you guys do. And I looked down, and I was like, why would you tell her? I mean, my wife doesn't even know. Why would you tell a stranger all this, you know? And you know, now she wants money. Now we have to pay her. For a few days, they pay her hush money. But then she started to want more, and then she was telling us that, hey, my, my man's in jail. We need to get him out. I need money, and I want it now. She threatens to reveal their scam to police in a bid to get her boyfriend's sentence reduced, so they pay her off again. A few days later, it seems like everything has blown over. Morikawa's wife leaves the country to visit her mother. As soon as she's gone, Morikawa and Lewis start planning a trip to Atlantic City to hit their casinos. I get a knock at a door. There's a guy at the door and says, hey, my son threw a ball in, in, in your backyard. Can you go get it? As I was turning around to get the ball out of the backyard, he grabs me, throws me on the ground. The two other agents jump out of the bushes. Um, they're fully armed, and uh, they're rushing into the house uh, over me. They are enforcement agents from the Nevada Gaming Control Board. Lewis's blackmailer has apparently turned them in after all. Enough information was developed to obtain a search warrant. And uh, when the home was searched, every piece of evidence we were looking for was there. The whole setup was found. The chips are of such quality that, they, that some of those that have been passed in the, in the recent past may not have been detected yet. Stunned Las Vegas authorities must now deal with the fact that two construction workers have compromised the security of casino chips. 
Morikawa and Lewis are in jail. Three days later, the pair are brought before a judge. They were given $5 million bail, not for murdering someone, not for raping someone, for counterfeiting casino chips. Our state takes this stuff really seriously. Since neither can make bail, Morikawa and Lewis are taken back to the maximum security jail. The hefty bail makes Morikawa a celebrity among the inmates. When I came in there, a bunch of the people were like, oh, wow, your bail's $5 million. They called a, another guy over and was like, hey, you know, he has a higher bail than you. And um, he was a Russian guy. And not just any guy. The man has ties to a Russian gang. Met him and sat down and talked with him and, and told him my story. And he was interested. He's all about business. And uh, he was like, you know what? We do need to talk once, once you get out, if you get out, you know? A few days later, Morikawa's attorney gets him a new bail hearing. And it lowered my bail from $5 million to, I think it was like 12000 So uh, I, I could bail out. After ripping off the casinos for tens of thousands of dollars, Morikawa ends up serving just 10 days. Jeremy Lewis, his partner in crime, is not so lucky. His outstanding drug and forgery arrest warrants keep him behind bars. Morikawa is free, but deeply in debt. I made the house payments. I paid majority of the bills by doing what I was doing. And uh, now I have a, a case, and I need to pay my attorneys. Desperate, he calls the Russian, who's also just been released from jail. The Russian wants Morikawa to teach him how to make counterfeit chips. I was very concerned because I knew that if I got caught again, I would not get out. Once again, faced with overwhelming debts, Morikawa looks to counterfeiting as a way out. But this time, he won't get his hands dirty. For 25% of the profits, he agrees to train the Russians. I, I would take roads out of the way to meet with them. I would constantly watch for people uh, in my mirrors and, and see if anyone was following. Once the Russians are trained, they begin passing the phony chips at casinos. In Las Vegas, an alert casino employee spots a few of them. They looked a little different in the rack than the other chips and turned out to be counterfeit. Then we had to do some backtracking and try to find these people. The investigation leads to the only two people who've ever made chips that can pass for the real thing, Jeremy Lewis and Eric Morikawa. With Jeremy Lewis still in prison, that leaves Morikawa and agents are closing in. One day, um, I was training the Russian guys, and uh, there's a knock at the door. It's the police. We had all the chips and equipment laying around. I'm looking at the ceiling and trying to figure out a way to get out, and there's no way. And so as soon as they came in, I dropped to my knees and put my hands behind my head, and I knew I was arrested again. I'm sitting in jail, and I didn't think I was going to get out uh, until we went to court. Eric Morikawa hires a shrewd Vegas defense attorney. It's a move that pays off in spades. In 2006, Morikawa makes a deal and pleads guilty to six felony counts. He walks with five years probation and community service. The most time I spent in jail was a week and a half when I first got arrested. Uh, the second arrest, I was only in there a couple days before I bailed out. Still, Morikawa must make restitution for all the fraudulent chips he passed. Restitution is at 36,000 is what they could only find in the chips. I think we did over a million. And they claim that they're probably still in circulation. They can't even find them. I would not cheat Vegas again. It's easy money and it's fast, but it's not worth it. It's not worth uh, uh, giving up your livelihood and your family and embarrassing your family, no. Morikawa's counterfeit scam is a wake-up call for Vegas. Today, many casinos protect their chips using a high-tech device called RFID, short for Radio Frequency Identification. It has a small electronic chip embedded in the chip somewhere and uh, can keep track of what the chip is and, and how many of them are on the table. It's an identifier. They use RFID scanners at both the gaming tables and the cage, making it impossible for a low denomination chip to be mistaken for a high one, no matter what the face of the chip reads. 
While new technology keeps chips safe from manipulation, easy money is always a target for the world-class Vegas cheater. One in particular stands out, both for the simplicity and sheer audacity of his crime, Anthony Carleo. One of the things about Anthony Carleo was that he seemed to have this need to be a larger-than-life figure. He had this sense of invincibility about him. He's not somebody that uh, lived the life of a criminal. I think he just kind of had this downward spiral, this, this sudden snapping. In an exclusive phone interview, Carleo tells us, in his own words, how he became one of Vegas's most notorious criminals. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been on a gambling binge or lost a significant amount of money, but you, know, you start losing it to chase. With those losses mounting, Carleo is desperate. He concocts a bold plan to capture a cash jackpot. Your heart's beating, or you're short of breath. A roller coaster ride of, of, of adrenaline. On his motorcycle, Carleo cuts through Vegas traffic with ease. He pulls into the Suncoast Casino. I basically want to get in and get out in as little time as possible. The Suncoast is the West Las Vegas Hotel Casino that's usually frequented by the local neighborhood people. Leaving the engine running, Carleo walks directly to the cage. Dressed entirely in black with a motorbike helmet, he pulls a pistol from his waistband. I chose the Suncoast because A, I knew there was going to be a lot of money there, and B, I knew it would be easy to get in and out. At the end of the day, 45 steps into the casino and the same 45 steps out the door. Told the cashier to reach into the drawer, grab stacks of cash, put it into a bag. No security guards try to stop him. It's better to let people have the money. That's really the policy, is to let that happen, because weapons are a liability. You could have somebody wrongfully shoot somebody. So in the end, we'll just call the police. Let them handle it. That's their job. That's what they do. In just minutes, it's over. Carleo heads into the neon night with almost $20,000. Once you pull out of the parking lot and you hit the road, you arrive in the safety of your own home. You're sitting there looking at 20 grand, and it's like, oh, wow, that wasn't that bad. Carleo hits so hard and fast, Vegas is caught off guard. And since his bike helmet and visor make him unidentifiable, the police are left with no clues. Just five days later, once again, Carleo gets on his bike and rolls down the heart of the Vegas Strip. This time, he pulls into the opulent Bellagio Hotel and Casino. I literally parked my motorcycle facing the street. I waved at a security guard. Carleo jogs into the casino, but the cage is too far away to reach quickly, so he heads to the high-end gaming tables. I literally just walked up to the back of the table. I told everybody to move. I started grabbing the chips, shoving them in my bag. Went straight for the high-dollar casino chips, which were the cranberry-colored ones, valued at $25,000. He also grabbed several white ones, which were valued at $5,000. I can tell you this with almost all certainty that had there been more of a presence of security there, I probably would not have had the guts to walk in there. I was also aware that the, of the fact that they did not carry firearms. It shouldn't have been that easy, but unfortunately, it was. This time, Carleo takes off with more than a million dollars worth of chips. Although the chips are embedded with RFID identification devices, they can only be tracked inside the casino. Outside, the tracking devices stop working. Well, I was actually pursued by a police officer for a period of time. They chased me in a very short lived because I was on a motorcycle. I was probably doing 115 to 125 miles an hour. Carleo disappears into the night. In response to the robberies, casinos across town add undercover personnel to patrol gaming floors. Cages go on high alert. Eight days after the second robbery, authorities get their first break. Hey when a dealer from the Bellagio comes forward anonymously, he tells them about a suspicious player who'd been in the day before the heist. He started talking to him about the possibility of robbing the Bellagio. He said, I'd like to get my hands on some of these cranberries. 
Cranberries, of course, are worth 25,000. The dealer patiently listens and has the guy believing that he can trust him. Eventually, he gets the guy's name. It's Anthony Carleo. When investigators look into Carleo's background, they find an unlikely stick-up guy. Carleo is the son of a Las Vegas judge, but he grows up in Pueblo, Colorado with his mother. After moving to Las Vegas in 2009, he enrolls at UNLV to pursue his childhood dream of becoming a physician. He has no criminal record, but in his first semester at college, Carleo gravitates to the casinos. I was playing at a $2, $5 Texas Hold'em game, and they go up from there. Play shibets, play shibets. I was playing crap. There was nights I'd go in and use five, six thousand dollars playing crap. Seven out seven. Go up and down, you have good days and bad days. When detectives check his bank records, they discover no reportable income other than a grant check from UNLV for $4,000. From an informant, they also learned that after a car wreck earlier that year, Carleo had been prescribed the narcotic painkiller, oxycodone. Anthony Carleo certainly fits a profile of someone desperate enough to steal, but police don't have enough evidence to arrest him. But if it is him, it means there's a gambler with a drug habit and a gun looking to break even. He has an ace in the hole, the $25,000 chips, but cashing them in would be risky. I didn't intend to grab as many of the big chips that I ended up grabbing. My intent was to grab the $5,000 chips and anything under that amount. With so many stolen high-end chips on the street, the Bellagio takes action and discontinues the $25,000 chips. The Bellagio has the authority to withdraw and refuse to accept those denomination chips. The Gaming Control Board then will be conducting an investigation to determine whether or not a person who is presenting those chips actually won them. The day after the $25,000 chip recall, Carleo returns to the Bellagio, this time without his gun, to play poker and blackjack. The dealer who'd reported him earlier is out of town for the holidays. So when Carleo uses the lower denomination stolen chips, he goes undetected. I had already been a player at the Bellagio, nothing extravagant, but it was enough to where me cashing in a $5,000 chip would not have raised any red flags. On New Year's Eve, Carleo again uses the lower denomination chips. He quickly loses $70,000. By the middle of January, he's down more than 100,000 stolen dollars. Even though it was money that I gained from the robbery, it was still money in my pocket. And to have that and to lose it really didn't feel any different than losing it had I not robbed it. At this point, Carleo has bet so much money, he is considered a high roller. A few days later, he returns to the Bellagio and gets comped a room and meals. When he cashes out more money than he wins, Bellagio's security staff suspects he's using the stolen chips. They notify Metro Police in Nevada Gaming. Now they have Carleo in their sights, but they still have to connect him directly to the robberies. They watch and wait. Carleo's losing streak continues. Sooner or later, he might make a play using one of the $25,000 cranberries that everyone is watching for. The only way that I could redeem the chips was to either gamble them or exchange them for cash. To avoid being caught, Carleo attempts to fence the hot chips online. From day one, I knew that I should have thrown them away. Despite that, I had a hard time throwing a million dollars in chips away. It's kind of cool to look at any dollars of chips, whether they were worthless or they had any value whatsoever. He posts several messages in poker playing chat rooms. That was uh, one of the crazy things. He was going, you know, these online poker sites, trying to figure out how to get rid of them. Though audacious, Carleo's behavior lacks the sophistication of a professional felon. He even posted a photo of a couple of the cranberry chips, and he called himself the Biker Bandit. He was pretty much saying, it's me, come and get me. Well, the Biker Bandit wasn't the sharpest tool in the, in the box, that's for sure. 
police get an anonymous tip that Anthony Carleo is calling himself the Biker Bandit, and he's trying to sell his $25,000 cranberry chips for $10,000 cash. Police finally have what they need to set him up. An undercover detective contacts Carleo, Hello? posing as a buyer for the stolen chips. Yeah. I let myself be vulnerable, I guess, and I, I trust the people I shouldn't have trusted. That was probably due to greed on some level. It's hard to turn $10,000 away for a piece of plastic in your pocket. Just a few days later, the trap is set. Carleo brought in several chips. Uh, the undercover cop promised him $100,000. And then when the Carleo left the chips, that was it for Mr. Carleo. The next day, Vegas Metro Police announced Carleo's arrest to the news media. We want to send a clear message to those who think that they can come to Las Vegas, commit a robbery using a weapon, and get away with it is sadly mistaken. Anthony Carleo pleads guilty to the casino robberies and is sentenced to serve between 8 and 27 years in prison. An inmate at Nevada Department of Corrections, Lovelock Correctional Center. From Lovelock Prison in Nevada, 30-year-old Anthony Carleo reflects on his crimes. I had an excellent life. I was on the right track. Here I am, going to lose nearly a decade of my life. They could have gave me uh, $10 million to come to 10 years in prison, and I would say, you're great. The one thing that can't be replaced is time. Everything else is replaceable. Most Hall of Fame cheaters aren't as brazen as Anthony Carleo. Instead, they make their mark by taking advantage of easy targets. He's a predator. He's a shark swimming among the anchovies out there. He's looking for the lazy person. He's trying to find that weak link that we have. And then he's going to go in and take advantage of it. And there's one cheat who makes it into the Hall of Fame for not knowing when to quit. The Hard Rock Casino. A pit boss notices a player placing large bets at a poker table. He contacts surveillance. And that call came up as we have a high limit player, and the name was Clifton Burnham. When we went into the system to look up the history of Clifton Burnham, there was a noticeable pattern of wins and losses. He always won on a certain day of the week, and all the rest of the time, it was obvious losses. His lucky day is Sunday, and June 15th, 2000 happens to be a Sunday. They look back over the past few hours of play. Burnham has been on a winning streak at Pi Gal. Pi Gal is an Asian poker game played against the dealer. But like all casino games, dealers play for the cameras. As the surveillance team watches Burnham, they see a problem but it's with their own dealer. If I'm watching a game, the dealers have certain procedures that they have to do at certain times. When they break that procedure, that's a red flag. Then we have to look and see why are they breaking procedures. And if they're breaking the procedures with a certain person, could that person be in collusion with the dealer? The dealer has worked at the casino for five years. We really didn't have a lot of problems out of him, but um, at one point, we noticed that he was doing a poor card spread. Because there are so many ties in Pi Gal, dealer protocol is to spread the cards for the camera. Here, Burnham has lost the hand, but the dealer is doing what's called a quick spread, picking up the cards immediately, making it look like a tie so the player loses no money. So why is this dealer intentionally dumping the game for Burnham's benefit? One hour later, they have a possible answer when security has slipped an anonymous letter. And what this anonymous letter stated was, you have a customer and a dealer who are in collusion on your poker pie gal game, and the name this customer is using is Clifton Burnham. But his real name is James Shahady. And at that point, I let out a few expletives ran back upstairs, and by then he was gone. James Shahady's reputation is well known in Las Vegas. 
Jimmy Shahady was a criminal. He's a career crook. He's a dirtbag. I went back, pulled the schedule for the previous month to see if there was a correlation between his wins and the dealer that was on the game. And sure enough, there is a connection. Shahady has been winning for four straight Sundays as Clifton Burnham. He always won with this particular dealer only. The dealer, a longtime employee of the Hard Rock, had racked up steep gambling debts. The dealer in question owed money to a guy from the sports book. He had borrowed money from the guy and couldn't pay it back. That individual in question owed money to James Shahady. So how better to pay it back than to give him a cheating dealer? What a friend, right? Hey, I got a friend, he, guy owes me money, he's dealing over at this joint, you go in, he dumps the game to you, we're all happy. Since the dealer never collects on Shahady's losing bets, Shahady is able to play for hours, making money on every hand he does win. Basically, he can never lose on this game. So every hand where he's gonna lose, he's gonna give him the signal, he's gonna do the quick spread, throw the cards in the discard, and say it was a push. So every time he wins, even when he doesn't win, he still wins because he doesn't lose. So they just take the money every time. Once the dealer repays his debt, he plans to stop cheating. But Shahady isn't willing to let the scam go. When you find something that good, why would you give it up? This guy, he's not gonna let you just walk away. You just committed a felony. You just did something that's gonna ruin your life. And I own you for it. The dealer was very scared. Uh, Shahady was representing himself as a member of organized crime. He's telling the guy, unless you do what I want, bad things are gonna happen to you. And the dealer believed it. And that's where June 15, 2000 comes into play. Desperate and looking for a way out, the dealer writes the anonymous letter to security before starting his shift. Two hours later, security finds the letter. At the same time, surveillance sees a break in procedure. Faced with evidence of a cheat, the Hard Rock calls the Nevada Gaming Control Board. They came out, looked at the videotape, and at that point, we waited for the following week for Mr. Shahidi to come in, and indeed he did. On the actual security tape, the dealer begins his shift. Moments later, James Shahidi sits down and the cheat plays out on camera. After Shahidi loses the hand, the dealer picks up the cards and does another quick spread, as if Shahidi's hand was actually pushed. That's all authorities need to see. At that point, the gaming agents came down, arrested the dealer, and arrested Shahidi from the casino floor. After he's dragged away in handcuffs, the dealer confesses. He's been part of the scam for more than a year. The dealer got himself in too deep. He owed the guy money. Next thing he knows, he's dumping this game for $70,000, $80,000. For testifying against Shahidi, the dealer is let go. Shahidi is convicted and is sentenced to 12 to 48 months. A year later, his luck runs out on a Friday night. He dies in prison at the age of 60. Shahidi's shameless strong arming of the hard rock dealer earns him a place in the Cheater Hall of Fame. But there's one cheat, shrewder, smarter, and more successful than any who have come before or since he hit Vegas. Dennis Nickrash. During his career, he steals a whopping $16 million. Dennis Nickrash was a genius, and that was one of his strengths. He really knew what was needed to cheat a machine, to, to perform different types of criminal acts. For him to stop stealing, he die of boredom. It's a challenge to him. He has to do it to show the public that he could do it, to show the Game and Control Board he could do it, to show the industry he could do it. It was just uh, an ego thing, I believe. Nick Rash's road to infamy begins in Chicago. Dennis Nick Rash started off as a, as a locksmith, and he found that he was very proficient at, at breaking in the locks. And he ended up uh, having some friends who were organized crime and tied to the Genovese crime family. Well, he started working with them, breaking into cars and jewelry stores and businesses until he eventually got caught. Dennis Nickrash serves a year in prison. 
After his release in the 1970s, he sets his sights on Vegas. Using a tool called the slider, he breaks into slot machines. He could slide the device through the door crack and activate the mechanism with the uh, sliding device and pay out. As casinos lose money, manufacturers redesign the machines so they are more difficult to cheat. But Nick Rash is undaunted by the changes. He buys a machine and does the impossible, manipulates the slot machine itself to create a winning jackpot on command. Although his precise techniques remain a mystery, the first battle is learning how to open up a slot machine in a casino undetected. Dennis Nick Rash is a burglar. He's a locksmith, so he can open it without setting off the alarm. The alarm is a warning alert, programmed to go off five seconds after the door is opened, so Nick Rash must act quickly. He manually adjusts each of the reels to a jackpot setting. Then he triggers the jackpot bells, closes the door, and all anyone hears is the cheerful dinging of another slot's winner. Nick Rash has the system beat. From 76 to 83, his cunning nets him $10 million. The interesting part of this is that when we found out about it, that this was going on, we inspected known machines, machines that we knew he had cheated, and there was no indication that the machines had been cheated. But in 1986, the law finally catches up to him. He serves another five years. Once he got out of jail, he's back on the streets, things had changed dynamically because of the, the electronics and the, the camera surveillance coverage and the type of machines, video machines rather than real machines, computer chips and motherboards and all this stuff is out there now. All of Dennis's previous cheating devices, their antiques, uh, they're basically useless. But Nick Rash is more than up for the challenge. He sets out to adapt his skills to the computer age. It's when he went back to the Genovese crime family and was hooked up with a computer expert. And once Nick Rash gets his hands on an updated slot machine, he comes up with a way to beat the new technology. He was re-engineering computer code and finding out how to corrupt that code, how to rewrite the code, and more importantly, how to erase the code when the scam was done so that he, he couldn't be discovered. Dennis. Oh, Jimmy. What's up, buddy? What's up, buddy? How are you? They create a small device they could sneak into a casino. And this handheld computer would have to be inserted into the circuit board, placed on top of the RAM, where they would input the winning combination. Dennis was able to override the computer by piggybacking one computer chip on top of another computer chip inside the machine and set up the jackpots. Good luck. There's just one last detail to address, not getting caught. And he would usually have a group of people with him. They're called blockers and their jobs were to block the cameras and block security guards from seeing what he was doing. After they decided which slot machine and which casino they would hit, they would set up cameras, surveillance cameras, in his garage uh, at a similar angle. And then he and his blockers would practice how to block the cameras, and they would know exactly where they were supposed to stand. In the fall of 1996, Nick Rash and his team hit the casinos. Dennis Nick Rash would set up his blockers, enter the casino. He would use his locksmith skills to open the door. Then he would insert his uh, handheld computer and install the winning combination. Once he completed that, which only took a matter of seconds, then he would leave the casino and the collector would sit down hit the button, wheels would start rolling, the blockers would move away, and the cameras would show the winning combination rolling into place. The team's first hit is modest for Nick Rash, $30,000, but he soon grows bolder. Eight months later, Nick Rash and his team take Harris for $3.8 million. Then they cheat the Rio and Luxor and other casinos for millions more. Dennis Nick Rash usually took about 70% and split 30% among all of his 
assistance. He uh, stole and stole and stole. Eventually, something's going to happen. The uh, camera is going to be right here on 2 o'clock up around the corner. For the cheat to keep working, Nick Rash regularly replaces his team. He had to have different people collect because you can't have the same person at one casino win a $3 million jackpot and then two days later win another jackpot at a different casino. So he had to have collectors that he could uh, cycle through. The problem with having a large team of people working together is somebody's going to get unhappy, somebody's going to get in a fight, somebody's going to rat you out. In 1998, Nick Rash is plotting his biggest heist yet, the Mega Bucks jackpot worth $17 million. He has Vegas in the palm of his hand. But 300 miles away, his plan starts unraveling. One of his accomplices got in trouble with the FBI in Phoenix, Arizona. He started talking about Dennis Nick Rash and how he was cheating at slot machines. Working with the FBI, the Nevada Gaming Control Board gets a search warrant for Nick Rash's home. Detectives find two slot machines, along with dozens of cheating devices. In his safe deposit box, they discover the handheld computer he uses to cheat the slots. After a two-decade crime spree that nets $16 million, the king of slot cheats reign is finally over. Nick Rash is arrested for the last time. Dennis Nick Rash is convicted and offered a deal by prosecutors, a lighter sentence in exchange for revealing how his scams work. As a criminal, Nick Rash is a consummate professional. He refuses. He later tells interviewers, I have no desire to explain anything, never smarten up a chump. He is sentenced to seven and a half years in prison. He is released in 2004 and dies in 2010 and the secrets to his extraordinarily successful cheats die with him. But in Vegas, legends live on, and Dennis Nick Rash has secured his place in the Cheater Hall of Fame. Dennis Nick Rash is uh, one of the greatest cheaters that we've ever caught in the history of Nevada. There's a lot of cheaters out there, and hopefully they're not as successful as Dennis Nick Rash was. Only time will tell if another criminal mastermind is out there right now. A future Hall of Famer beating the casinos with a cheat no one's ever pulled off before. The message I would give to someone who's thinking of cheating Vegas is practice, practice, practice. Because we're good. We do this all the time. We do it every day. So you should be good when you come in to do it. You're probably going to end up in jail. And, and that's permanent. You know, you're going to get caught.